So we got the idea that we would uh, have Ms. Hamill come in and give a presentation because we were in the midst of writing our policy, drafting our policy regarding transgender students and staff. And so here we are, and I'm not going to speak any word, and I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hamill. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. All right, as Dean mentioned, I'm Chrissy Hamill. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm generally pretty loud, so um, I figure I don't need a microphone. Uh, as Dean said, I've spoken a lot on the issue of um, transgender students, uh, transgender employees, and just transgender issues in general over the past nine months or so. Um, I mentioned to Dean earlier the impetus of the uh, presentation for the state convention that was held in January actually came a year ago in June when transgender issues were kind of starting to be talked about across the nation. I had a few school district clients that came to me and said, we're interested in developing a policy, what do we do? And I thought, you know, maybe this is something that schools might find interesting. The area of the law isn't well settled. Nobody knows for sure what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to treat transgender students. This might be an interesting topic. And lo and behold, since June of last year, things have really blown up. And we've seen a lot in the area of transgender issues. Um, I like to start my presentations by kind of taking us back to basics and, talk, and really focusing on what these terms are that we're using. What does transgender mean? What does gender identity mean? There's lots of terms that are thrown about. And there really is kind of a whole new vocabulary that we might be dealing with than what we're traditionally used to seeing. And so the big ones here that you might hear me referencing throughout this presentation tonight are gender identity. And that's really one's sense of how they identify as an individual. Um, one of the things I do know is that gender identity is generally established as young as age four. And I think that comes as a shock to a lot of people because we've seen um, you know, adult celebrities that have now just begun their transition. And so it's something that might be kind of hard to grapple with that really students as young as four years old are dealing with um, this, this sense of self that might be different than what it appears on the outside. Um, gender expression, of course, then, is how an individual expresses themselves. Um, obviously, this can be different than what their biological gender is that they are born. Um, transgender, of course, is a person, again, who identifies with a gender different than that um, that they were biologically born with. And then transition is the process in which a person goes um, from living as one sex to transitioning to the other. Um, again, this is sort of a whole new vocabulary. These are different terms that are used. Um, I won't use many of these throughout my presentation, but I just want to make you aware of the different terminology that is out there. Uh, one of the big questions I've been asked as well is transgender the same thing as sexual orientation? No, it is not. Um, transgender is um, more about identity um, with yourself and who you feel as an individual. Well, sexual orientation, as we know, is more of a sense of who I might be attracted to. Um, some of these other terms may, uh, may be something that you don't hear about. A lot of them are regional terms. So what you might hear um, a transgender group identify themselves with in the um, Pacific Northwest might be different than what we see on the East Coast, the South, and then here in the Midwest. So the biggest question then that, that we're asked when we're dealing with transgender students is why should my district care? And just if you go on to Google, type in transgender, you'll find hundreds if not thousands of articles about the different issues, um, different concerns, uh, different problems that uh, employers, school districts, um, and individuals are dealing with. Time Magazine has dubbed this the transgender tipping point, and I always use this quote um, because I think it really describes what has happened over the course of the past year and even probably over the course of the past five years. And right now we really are at the tipping point. I think we saw this with um, gay marriage um, over the course of the past few years and the trajectory, trajectory of gay marriage where we started here and maybe ended up here. And I think transgender issues are starting to move along that same trajectory as well. 
Um, back in 2015 of July, so almost a year ago, the Atlantic said that schools are becoming ground zero for transgender issues. And I'm sure as you know from um, everything you've heard in the news, that can't be more true. Schools really are becoming sort of the battleground for these issues. A um, little bit less than a week ago, on May 31st again, the Atlantic had another article about transgender issues. And it said that America's experienced a period of profound gender anxiety. I think there might be a number of reasons for that. Again, these issues are becoming more public um, through the likes of people like um, Caitlyn Jenner um, and the transition from Bruce to Caitlyn that we have seen. It's more public. Um, of course, it's huge this election cycle as well, and I'm going to try not to talk politics too much with you because I don't necessarily think that has a place in schools, but it really has um, led to this sort of trajectory for transgender um, rights and transgender issues. And so schools across the nation are finding themselves subject to OCR complaints. Um, you've probably heard many instances of students protesting in support of uh, fellow transgender students and maybe on the flip side of that as well. And so schools really, really are sort of the, the ground zero for these types of issues. Uh, the state of the law recently, I think it's important to just look, about, look at what's happened over the course of the past two months. Um, of course, you are probably all aware in March that North Carolina for, passed the nation's first transgender bathroom bill. And when I say the first, they are certainly not the first state that has addressed transgender issues, but they are the first state in the nation that has passed a bill that says that um, those in the public sector, your counties, your state government, your cities, your villages, your towns, um, have to bar um, transgender individuals from using the restrooms of the gender in which they identify. Basically, North Carolina has said that whatever sex you are born, that's the restroom you must use. Um, this has garnered a lot of national attention, as you know. It's been plastered all over the news. And again, not much more than a month later, um, April 6, excuse me, April 19th of 2016, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, which encompasses the state of North Carolina, said that Title IX, which protects students, um, extends to protect the rights of transgender students to use the restrooms of the gender in which they identify. Um, I'll talk more about this decision as we go along, but it's really a key decision that has come out um, on the side of students and, and transgender issues. On May 3rd, um, the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, issued guidance to states. And although it doesn't, the EEOC never comes out and says this, it really is in response to that bathroom bill that was passed by North Carolina. Um, the EEOC basically said that Title VII, which is the anti-discrimination statute that protects race, color, religion, sex, um, and national origin, um, the EEOC said that Title VII protects transgender individuals. And basically this guidance then says that states should be allowing individuals to use whatever restroom they choose in accordance with the gender in which they identify. Um, May 9th, the saga still is not over as we've seen dueling lawsuits, one filed by North Carolina alleging um, that the, uh, the EEOC is overstepping its bounds, that the federal government is overstepping its bounds with its guidance that um, Title VII extends to protect, to protect transgender individuals. And then we have the U.S. Department of Justice um, filing suit um, against North Carolina claiming that their law uh, violates Title VII. And so there's dueling lawsuits. We'll see what happens and see how those play out. Of course, as you know, um, and what you've seen in the news, the legal process is very slow to play out. So uh, we continue to watch that to see what happens. Uh, May 13th, came probably the most um, important and most significant piece of information for school districts. Every public school in the nation on May 13th received an email from the Department of Justice and the Department of Education providing what they deem to be significant guidance um, on these uh, transgender issues in schools. Now, what this means is that it really is simply guidance. Um, what the Department of Education and Department of Justice have come out and said in this um, guidance is not law. Um, it certainly can be challenged in courts, and quite frankly, school districts aren't required to follow it. However, if complaints are made against school districts, 
the Department of Education is the department that is going to hear those complaints in the first instance. So although it might not be the law and it might only be deemed guidance, um, it's deemed significant guidance because it does have um, significant implications for school districts if it's not followed. Um, on May 25th then, uh, Wisconsin joined Texas and nine other states in a lawsuit against the federal government with respect to this guidance that's been issued. So we have two sort of competing lawsuits at the federal level that are just starting and will soon take off. Uh, the one against the North Carolina bathroom bill, which again applies to all individuals and sort of the country as a whole. And then we have this very specific um, lawsuit, which again, Wisconsin has joined, um, that is going to be playing out. Um, one of the things I like to do in giving this presentation, I know what you're all looking for is for me to um, stand up here and tell you exactly what you need to do to stay out of trouble and avoid any issues with respect to um, transgender uh, status and transgender concerns. But I really like to kind of frame the issue by what's been happening, as I've already kind of done uh, with respect to where we are now. I find it interesting that in addition to the North Carolina bathroom bill, um, in April, the state of Mississippi did something unusual. And I say it's unusual because you've likely heard that many states across the nation have been attempting to pass legislation, um, either one way or another, with regard to access rights to restroom, restrooms, locker rooms, and changing facilities, um, either prohibiting access or allowing access. Um, Mississippi attempted to do the same thing, and they were unsuccessful. So what Mississippi did instead was they passed a law that attempted to define what it meant to be male and what it meant to be female. Um, and this is sort of step one in their process of attempting to um, define the issue. And you know, quite frankly, what they're doing is trying to go the way of barring access to restrooms. And so again, this is step one. They've identified male or female um, to refer to an individual's immutable biological sex. And uh, this is on the books in Mississippi. It hasn't been challenged yet. Um, likely, probably will be at some point. Um, but again, this just gives you an idea of what is happening and where we're at with um, respect to these issues. Again, North Carolina became the first state in the nation with this all-encompassing bathroom bill. Um, it's called the Single Sex Multi Multiple Occupancy Act. And basically what it does, again, is it requires you to use whatever restroom um, that corresponds to the gender, or excuse me, the sex that you were born. Um, and it does have a provision which actually prohibits uh, counties, towns, cities, and school districts from developing policies that would actually protect transgender individuals. And so not only does it prevent access, it also prohibits an entity from taking action that might expand upon um, an individual's rights. And again, um, as of May 25th, um, Wisconsin joined uh, the lawsuit that is challenging um, the Department of Justice and Department of Education's guidance. And so why, why I note this with respect to the North Carolina bathroom bill is I think these two issues are going to sort of play together. And once we get resolution of one issue, we're likely going to have clarity and resolution as to the other. One of the topics I'm going to spend just a very brief amount of time speaking about, and so if you do have questions, I'd encourage you to save them for the end, and I'm more than happy to address any questions, is what do we do with respect to employees? And the reason I don't address this a lot is, again, because the battleground is really over what, what do we do with regard to student rights. Um, there have been a lot of court cases that have come about in the past, probably 30 years or so, with respect to employees, and generally speaking, the law is a little bit more settled as to how we handle employee issues with respect to transgender. Um, as an initial matter, with respect to employees, the big seminal case with respect to transgender rights is really this Pricewaterhouse versus Hopkins case. Um, and this dealt with sex stereotyping, but this is a theory that has then been used by individuals who are transgender if they feel they've been discriminated against in the workplace. And what happened here is Price Waterhouse is a um, huge public accounting firm. There was an individual there who um, was not promoted. Um, she was a female, and she did not receive the same promotion despite 
identical performance to her male counterparts. And what her supervisor told her is that she doesn't dress feminine enough. She doesn't wear makeup. She doesn't wear dresses. She doesn't generally do her hair. She doesn't really hold herself out to be a female. She acts macho. She doesn't walk femininely enough, talk femininely enough, act femininely enough. And so she filed suit against her employer, employer and actually prevailed because there the court said that Title VII does protect individuals from discrimination based on sex stereotyping. And so in 1989, this was really the impetus of the trajectory for transgender rights, um, sexual orientation rights, um, and rights for individuals who generally don't identify um, with the gender in which they were born. Um, since that time, really the two most significant uh, rulings, so to speak, that have come about have been through the EEOC. Um, the EEOC, again, is the entity that enforces Title VII, the discrimination law. So there were two rulings, one in 2012 and one in 2014. The Mia Macy, Mia Macy ruling um, is interesting because this was sort of the first time that the EEOC came out really aggressively in support of transgender rights. And in this case, we had a police officer um, who was male, and her supervisor recommended uh, that he apply for a position with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, a federal position. And on paper, if you looked at this particular individual, he was phenomenal. Uh, absolute best candidate for the position, um, and hands down, had this position handed to him on a golden platter. That is until he informed the Bureau of ATF that he was transitioning to a female. And at that point in time, he was then informed that the job had been filled um, and that he was no longer uh, being considered for the position. And so he filed a case for um, alleging discrimination against his employer. And there the EEOC said that um, discrimination based on transgender status is a violation of Title VII. And again, it was really the first proclamation that we had for employees from the EEOC. Um, one of the things that's important with, that you understand with respect to the EEOC is, again, it's not technically the law. Um, the EEOC, of course, is responsible for enforcing um, Title VII, but once the EEOC makes a decision, it, goes, it can go through our court system. And so these are the types of decisions that stand as guidance um, that we can rely upon for determining how it is we need to treat our employees, but it's technically not the law. Um, another, another case then is the Lusardi decision, and that's from 2014, and there, this dealt with um, an individual, a disabled vet, who was employed by the U.S. Army. Um, it was a position where, um, again, she was um, employed by the Army, I should say rather, he was employed by the Army, um, was transitioning to a female, and as part of that transition wanted to have access to the female restrooms. And the Army, of course, said, no dice, you can have this single occupancy stall that you can use that is solely designated for you um, because you are transitioning. And again, of course, the EEOC said, no, um, that is a clear violation of Title VII. And so in terms of where we're at with the federal law, again, we don't have clarity because this isn't technically the law, but it provides guidance to us as to, again, how we should be treating our employees. In 2014, um, the Department of Justice, again, they are not the ones who create law. Congress creates the law. Um, but the DOJ came out with a memorandum in uh, December of 2014, again, confirming what the EEOC has already said, that Title VII protects uh, transgender status. Um, interestingly, the uh, Seventh Circuit has really declined to adopt an expansive view, and there's a case that's called U-Lane versus Eastern um, airlines, and that's really of no significance to you, but I bring it up because of this U-Lane case a lot of times is cited by employers for a rationale for denying equal access to transgender employees. And um, the interesting thing that you have to think about when you see that case is they're absolutely right, is that the Seventh Circuit declined to expand uh, Title VII to cover transgender individuals, but that case is from 1984. And so we're dealing with a case that's over 30 years old, and if um, the Seventh Circuit would hear that case today, I have a suspicion that the Seventh Circuit would probably decide that differently, especially in light of the fact that the Seventh Circuit has already said that it is okay, or I shouldn't say that, they've, they've um, struck down Wisconsin's um, law that basically says that if you are an inmate and you're transitioning, 
and you are then sentenced um, to imprisonment, you can't continue with your um, transition therapy that you were once receiving. And so in that case, the Seventh Circuit said, you know what, even if you're an inmate, you still have the right to continue with those medical treatments with that hormone therapy. And so in light of that decision, I find it hard to believe then that the Seventh Circuit would say, inmates are okay and we're gonna protect inmates as they transition, but we're not gonna protect our employees in the workforce. I bring up one um, case that's from um, 2002, and I bring it up because, again, we're talking you know, almost 15 years ago that we started discussing these issues. And here, um, the Eighth Circuit was looking at Minnesota law, and basically it said that um, under Minnesota law that um, employers were neither required or prohibited from having restrooms that were um, designated according to self-image of gender or according to biological sex. And why this is significant is because the issue in this case was it was brought by an individual who felt that her privacy rights were being violated um, and that went against her moral beliefs for somebody of transgender status to be using the same facilities that she was. She felt that it was a safety risk to her, that it was a threat to her privacy and moral interest, and she alleged, therefore, that the, the, her coworker um, should not be allowed to use the restrooms and facilities of the gender in which she identifies. And the Eighth Circuit, which is a federal court, said based on Minnesota law, um, this woman had no claim, that the rights of the transgender individual were paramount to this individual's concerns over safety and privacy. Again, it's based on state law, but telling as to the trajectory um, where things are headed. Um, as to students, as you know, those of you know who are intimately involved in these issues at the school, um, the, the Department um, of Education Office of Civil Rights, OCR, has really taken an aggressive stance on this in the past couple of years. Um, November 20, uh, 2015 was really um, sort of the tipping point, I think, for us here in Wisconsin as far as guidance to districts. Again, no clear statement of law, but in terms of guidance, um, again, the Department of Education has come out very strong. And of course then, um, in April, we had the decision out of the Fourth Circuit where it was the first time a federal court affirmed that um, transgender students have the right to be protected under Title IX. So I'm gonna take a step back. What does Title IX mean? What does it protect? Well, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, this is the law that you've heard me talk about. It's the law that applies to schools. It's the one that we have to worry about because um, Title IX applies to any institution that's receiving federal funding. And if you look at school districts, almost every aspect of school district operations is controlled by federal funding in some way or another. Um, so the fundamental question that we're really looking at when courts are analyzing this issue is whether Title IX extends to protect um, transgender students. And um, the Price Waterhouse case that I mentioned, that sex stereotyping case of the woman who was too macho and not feminine enough, um, hasn't necessarily been used in the student context, but it's one theory that I think we're going to see um, really grow as students start to challenge uh, school districts on their decisions and maybe prohibitions with respect to transgender students. So just keep in mind, we're, we're talking about Title IX, we're talking about discrimination based on sex, and that it applies to institutions that receive federal funding. Wisconsin, of course, has a uh, student non-discrimination statute as well, um, and again, it protects um, gender or excuse me, discrimination based on a person's sex, and it also extends to protecting an individual's sexual orientation, but it's also silent as to transgender status. Um, we will, I think, see that both Title IX and um, Wisconsin non-discrimination law remains silent for a period of time until we see the decisions that come out of our uh, federal and state courts. Um, but as the law stands now with respect to students, um, both on the federal side under Title IX and under Wisconsin's non-discrimination law, transgender students are not protected. Um, and I say that they're not protected, that doesn't necessarily mean that the school district's position should also be they're not protected. Just taking a step back in time, I'm sure you were all aware that in October of 2015, our legislature here in Wisconsin attempted to pass their own bathroom bill. 
Um, I, I will admit that the second that I saw this uh, come out, that there that Wisconsin had passed a bathroom bill, I was very excited. Um, because as I said, back in June, I was preparing a, a transgender speech for the state convention where we have administrators and school boards from across the state. And I thought, finally, we're going to have some information, some concrete info that I can provide to school districts. And then I read what the context of the bill was. Um, and, and the reason I sort of went from elated to seeing that we had passed a bill to sort of disappointment and disbelief is because the bathroom bill that Wisconsin passed is the same type of legislation that has either not been passed across the country or that has been incredibly controversial across the country. And it really doesn't provide districts with any clarity as to um, what they are supposed to be doing, especially in light of the fact that we have um, some differing guidance coming at the federal level. And I put all the points up here that are really covered under Wisconsin's own bathroom bill. Um, but what's important here is that Wisconsin was essentially going to require schools to designate restrooms, male, female, and whatever restroom uh, you would use as a student would be the restroom of the gender you were born. So whatever your biological sex was, that's what restroom you were required to use. Um, the, the bill itself included, um, included the ability of a school district to designate these single occupancy stalls for uh, transgender students to use or individuals who might feel uncomfortable using regular restrooms. But there was that, that significant distinction between our regular student population and then transgender students. Um, the Democrats then came up uh, with sort of a substitute bill. And I can't say that their bill was much better because their bill was really just that uh, they were going to tell DPI to adopt a model policy to provide to school districts and then really let school districts decide at the local level. So it didn't really provide any clarity to school districts other than saying, DPI, why don't you provide clarity to school districts? And if you recall DPI's model bullying policy that they came out with, it didn't really tell us much. It told us what bullying was, why it's not a good idea for schools to allow bullying to take place, but it didn't really tell us much more. There wasn't much more meat to it, and I think that's what uh, DPI's transgender policy would also look like because there isn't clarity. Um, so then what we had is the Republicans tried to um, develop a substitute amendment to try and clarify things, and all that it clarified was that Wisconsin's position was going to be that students had to use the gender, um, or excuse me, had to use the facilities of the gender um, that they were born with. Um, so we didn't really have clarity, and of course, uh, as you know, um, the bill just simply died. Um, there's been some talk now with North Carolina's bathroom bill that applies across the board to sort of the general public, employer, students, etc. that maybe Wisconsin will revive efforts um, and revive that bathroom bill, so that remains to be seen and something, again, I just want you to have on your radar as um, these issues continue to develop. Other states have also tried to pass similar legislation and it's died. Um, interestingly, in January of 2014, California was the first state um, to have a law mandating that schools uh, respect students' preferences. And again, that was back in January of 2014. It's now been two years past that time. Um, a few other states have joined the ranks of requiring schools to allow students to use facilities of the gender in which they identify. Um, and that extends not only to restrooms, but also to locker rooms and changing facilities as well. Um, 11 other states also have anti-discrimination policies on the books that may um, extend rights to transgender students as well, where Wisconsin's law is specifically prohibited, or excuse me, specifically um, applicable to sex and sexual orientation. Some states have a more expansive um, protection and coverage in their non-discrimination laws. One case I do uh, bring to your attention is the Nicole Maines case. You may have heard about this. Nicole Maines um, was a male uh, transitioning to a female. Uh, she was actually an identical twin, um, which doesn't really have any significance uh, to uh, her rights as a transgender individual, but it's just interesting. Um, if you go and type in Nicole Maine's name into Google, you will have hundreds of hits about this individual. I think they've made some reality television shows about her, um, and she's significant because it's the first time that the highest court in the state ruled in favor of a transgender student. And this was in Maine. 
she was awarded $75,000. Um, and I always use this case um, and tell my audiences about this case. I think I've presented on transgender issues maybe eight or nine times. And um, the one thing that, I, again, I think is interesting about this case is Nicole Maines was a first grader. And so we're not talking about a situation where you know we're dealing with a Bruce Jenner to Caitlyn Jenner of an adult. We're not talking about a 16-year-old. This was somebody as young as first grade, and the courts recognized uh, her right as a transgender student. And you know, just an aside, I would encourage you to, whatever side of the debate you fall on, um, go and look at her story up. It's pretty incredible um, how far she has come and what she has done and um, how she's advocating for the rights of transgender students. Um, it's just really interesting because I think back to what I was doing um, during my elementary and middle school and high school career, and I can't say that my, my, my history is as prolific as hers is. So um, take a look at it, it's really fascinating. Um, I mentioned previously that the Department of Education, OCR, has come out really, really strong um, against, uh, against school districts that uh, discriminate against transgender students. And this was a, um, a, a letter ruling from the Office of Civil Rights in Chicago. And the reason this is significant is this is the first time that a decision was ever issued by OCR on um, transgender rights, and this was the first time that OCR came out and said that you have to give unfettered access to students to the facilities um, and to use facilities of the gender in which they identify or risk losing your federal funding as a school district. And so what the OCR did in this case is it gave this um, school district, School District 211 in Schaumburg, Palatine, Illinois, 30 days to rectify the issue. Um, and so they did um, on day 30. Um, the district came to an agreement with OCR um, where they said that the district would provide access uh, to the student to the girls' <coughs> facilities. It was a male transitioning to female. Uh, that they would have a privacy curtain or other options for any student, not just the transgender student, but any student to utilize uh, in the event that students were uncomfortable um, sharing facilities. Um, that the school district would be required to coordinate with other um, school districts for off-campus district-sponsored activities, so uh, volleyball games, uh, debate club, speech club, things of that nature. Um, the school was required to coordinate with other districts. And the school would also engage a consultant um, and establish a support team to assist other students who might be going through the same um, transition uh, process and have the same concerns. And so it was a really um, scathing decision uh, that came out um, from OCR. And the reason I mention this uh, to you as a school district in Wisconsin is because the Chicago uh, Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights is the office that students would be filing a complaint with if they have issues against your district here in Wisconsin. And so if you do have a complaint that's lodged against you with the federal government that alleges Verona is violating the rights of a transgender student, it goes to this office that has come out very strongly and said, we will withhold your federal funding if you um, discriminate against students on the basis of their transgender status. Again, um, OCR is not a court, it's not the legislature, it's not law, um, but they have come out again and said you risk losing federal funding. And um, I you know, just caution you to be aware of what that might mean for your school district to lose every cent of federal funding. <coughs> again, this is the uh, federal appeals court case that uh, came out in April and said that schools cannot discriminate against students on the basis of transgender uh, status. Um, this decision is key. Again, it's the first federal appeals court that is found in favor of a student on transgender issues. This circuit um, does not set precedent uh, for us here in Wisconsin. Only the Seventh Circuit can do that. Um, but this case could be the first that goes up to the Supreme Court. I say that because on May 31st, um, I should take a step back. What happened in this case is a three-judge panel of the Court of Appeals uh, heard the appeal. Um, what a party can do after they lose is appeal and say, full, full court of seven judges, we want you to hear this case. And the full court declined, which essentially upholds the holding that transgender students have rights under Title IX. And it also paves the way for the school board, the losing school board, to appeal to the Supreme Court. 
So this could potentially be the first case um, where a school um, petitions the Supreme Court to hear the case and where we might have a decision um, from the Supreme Court. Uh, we'll know in 30 days if the school district decides to appeal this decision. I should say 30 days from May 31st, so a little bit sooner than 30 days. But we'll know in 30 days if, uh, if the appeal is moving forward. And then we'll learn a short time thereafter if the Supreme Court accepts um, the case for a review. The one problem, however, is that the Supreme Court has only eight justices right now. Um, in light of Justice Scalia's death. And so that's why, um, again, I think we're hearing a lot more about these issues this election cycle, because whoever becomes the next president, assumptively, is going to be appointing um, an individual to, feel, to fill that role on the court. So again, this is a case that we are very closely watching to see what is going to happen. Uh, I want to talk briefly about this Dear Colleague letter that <coughs> came out on May 13th. Again, it just offers significant guidance to schools. And it really covered these areas um, that transgender students have concerns with. Um, honoring a student's expressed gender identity, how you address the student using names and pronouns. Um, it prohibits medical documentation being required uh, to confirm that a student is transi transitioning or that a student is identifying as a gender that's different in which um, that is different than the gender in which the individual was born, equal application of policies, confidentiality, et cetera. There's a number of things that were, that were mentioned in that Dear Colleague letter. Um, again, I'm gonna talk more about this uh, as I get into sort of the discussion about what you should be aware of as a school district, but it is the most significant piece of information that we've received as school districts telling us how we should be handling these issues and what we should be doing. I briefly mentioned the WIAA policy as it applies to athletics here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, WIAA worked very hard um, at attempting to develop a policy a few years back as to how they were going to address students who were transitioning or students who had already transitioned and how they would allow those students to fit into uh, interscholastic athletics here in the state. And they did provide a significant guidance to schools as to what to do, but then they passed the ball onto the districts and required districts to really make policy implementing uh, what WIAA has come out with. And so um, what WIAA wants to see is a written student from, or excuse me, a written statement rather, from the student and the parent and guardian affirming uh, what the student's gender identity is. Um, documenting the affirmative actions that the student has taken uh, to start uh, the transition process, what the student is doing, um, documenting how the student is holding out him or herself to be, how the student's dressing, um, whether the student's you know, undergoing counseling or therapy in the transition process. Um, because WIAA, again, wants to make sure that it's alleviating the concerns that many express as to, well, what if we have an individual who's merely doing this for attention? Or what do, we, if, what do we do, how do we respond to an individual who is simply asserting one gender one day and is flip-flopping back and forth every day? Um, and I, you know, I have to say on that point, I don't think we see that often, but of course that's one of the fears that people have is that we're gonna have students who are constantly flip-flopping gender. Um, again, we haven't seen that, but the fear is out there. And so WIAA wants to really protect against this. Um, one of the more, I think, controversial provisions of the WIAA policy is that um, it, it does require medical documentation um, in order for students to uh, participate um, in accordance with the gender that they're transitioning to. And I say this is controversial because, as you notice from the guidance that was issued by the Department of Education and the Department of Justice, they have said you can't require uh, medical documentation. However, um, WIAA is trying to govern fairness of sports, fairness of participation, and so if you do have a male who has male hormones, um, testosterone, competing on female teams, there is perhaps an inherent unfair advantage uh, for that individual to be competing as a female. So WIAA wants to see um, some medical documentation. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that an individual who is 15 years old and is um, transitioning has to go through hormone therapy at age 15. 
what is required here is just documentation from the medical provider that shows that the student is under the medical provider's care and is going through the process or will be going through the process as that individual um, becomes of the proper ages to begin that hormone therapy or to begin um, the surgeries. So I put this slide up here. Um, these are just four different sort of bathroom signs that, that we see. And the reason I focus on bathrooms is because it's really the biggest issue that um, schools have, and I think quite frankly the biggest issue that we have with respect to employees, and the biggest issue that we have with respect to the general public. Generally speaking, nobody really bats an eye if I were to come up here and say that I wanted you to call me Christopher. You might think it was a little odd, but I think you'd all abide by my wishes and refer to me as Christopher as opposed to Chrissy. Um, generally the same thing can be said, I think, for transgender individuals. Um, that with respect to some issues, um, they're really non-issues, but the biggest one is restroom use. And so again, these are signs that we've kind of seen out and about. This blue one here um, is the sign that uh, California is using in their public institutions. So this one came from the University of California at Irvine um, that provides inclusive use for all genders. Um, the center sign there um, is from one of the articles that I found in the Atlantic, and I believe that came from um, a school district in the District of Columbia area. Um, the whichever sign um, is actually from the New Berlin School District. Um, it's a sign that they have up for one of their restrooms. Uh, the one caution I would throw out to you with that sign is I've been told that and the sign at the top as well is that those are not ADA compliant signs because they don't have a little braille writing on it. Um, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for what some of the signs look like. And then the bottom sign in the center here, the all gender restroom, is actually a sign that one of the um, sign manufacturers in the Milwaukee area has been producing in massive quantities uh, for entities all across the nation. And so again, just kind of a sampling of the signs that that we're seeing out there, um, signs that, you know, as we become more, more um, mindful of these issues that you're going to be seeing uh, out and about in the public. So now that I've kind of given you a background on the law, what I really want to focus on is maybe advice and guidance for you um, as a district, um, advice and guidance for you and the public as to how you might see school districts handling these issues. Uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot is transition plans. What I mean is not a transition plan for the student as to how they're going to transition, but how we as a school district are going to assist a student who is transitioning. Um, one of the questions that you might have is, are they even necessary? necessary? Do we even need a transition plan? And I would challenge you to think about um, how important it is to develop one of these plans. Um, it might look different for every student. It might not be the same. Um, because not all students will desire the same outcome. Maybe they will, um, but generally speaking, students are individuals. So we want to make sure that we're focusing on a student as we're developing these plans. Um, they also might vary with the age of the student. You might be looking at a very different conversation with a student who comes to you as an elementary school principal at the age of seven and says that I feel like I am a female, even though I'm a male, um, what can you do to help me, than the conversation with a 15 or 16 year old high school student. Um, what transition plans are are really internal processes that you develop as a district for how we're going to respond to a student who might come to us um, and indicate that they are um, transitioning or wanting to transition or maybe are just really unsure of how they're feeling. Uh, transition plans can address a whole host of factors. I'll get into them as I talk about policies, but I really think the important thing for you to think about is how are we going to respond to a student? Um, and again, these, these can be internal. It doesn't have to be something that you post as a board policy or as an administrative rule or in your student handbooks, but just something for you to think about internally. If I'm a principal and someone comes to me, what am I going to do? How am I going to respond? Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with your transgender policies because the things you're going to think about with the student who comes to you are who's going to speak with that student? Are we going to designate one principal, a school counselor, a school psychologist, um, a teacher? Um, who, who is it? A school nurse perhaps? Who are we going to have speak with the student? Are we going to have a team? Are we going to have one designated person? Are we going to do this sort of on an ad hoc basis, whoever's available? Um, 
who is going to sit down with the student, and then what are we going to talk about? You might talk about these, these different um, provisions uh, with the student with regard to what their transition might look like. Um, and then these are also, on the flip side, important provisions for you to think about as you develop policies uh, as a district, what provisions should be included. Um, and, and so when we're talking about our policies, the questions that we have are, you know, do we create a new policy? Uh, do we need a, a transgender specific policy as a district or can we simply revise one of the policies that we have? And I think it really depends on, on your district. You have to look at the policies that you have in place. Can we simply revise maybe our non-discrimination policy and insert a clause in there that says we're not going to discriminate against transgender students? Or do we need something that's a little bit more in depth uh, due to sort of the newness of this issue? Uh, these are suggested provisions that I would recommend uh, you include in policies. And again, I'm going to kind of get into each of these individually. Um, and I sort of refer to these as accommodation issues. These aren't accommodation issues that we might think of under the ADA when we're accommodating disabilities, but rather just ways we can help uh, students when they're transitioning. And one of the questions is always, what name do we use for the students? Um, generally, uh, you want to talk with the student about what the name is that, that the student is going to go by. Is the student changing the name? Is the student wanting to use different pronouns rather than than she and her, is it he and his? Um, what are the pronouns? Um, one of the things, again, I encourage you to think about is um, nobody would hesitate to call me Chrissy instead of Christine as I stand here before you. Chrissy's my nickname, I've always gone by it. Nobody would question that. So why would we, why would we question an individual who comes to you and says, well, my name's Matthew, but I prefer to be called Mia. So, um, you know, keep that in mind as, as it relates to a student's name. Uh, in terms of etiquette, what do I call you? One of the biggest areas that we see issues develop and the biggest reasons that um, employers or uh, schools find themselves in court is that um, they don't take seriously a student's or an employee's request as to what they're called. So in terms of etiquette, generally what you call a person is what they wish to be called. Um, and then pronouns that you use, the he, the she, the his, the her, are going to um, go hand in hand with what the, what the student or employee wants to be called. Um, what do you require as proof? Uh, this is a big issue because as I said, uh, the guidance from DOJ and DOE is that you can't require medical documentation, but what, what can you require? Um, and so, you know, you really just want to have a credible basis that the student really truly has a deeply held belief that he or she is um, of the opposite gender. Uh, one of the questions that I get asked a lot on the bottom here is, what if I personally have a problem with this? What if I don't agree? Um, and you know, what if you don't agree? Just like any other issue, it doesn't necessarily matter whether or not you agree or don't agree. You wanna do what's in the best interest of your student. Uh, dress codes are another issue, and this one I think is pretty easy because if you're going to have a dress code as to all your other students, simply apply that dress code with respect to your transgender students as well. If you want to want to allow a female to wear a halter top and a mini skirt that doesn't extend to um, the student's knee, you're certainly not going to allow a uh, transgender female to wear a mini skirt or a halter top. With uh, school records, one of the things I caution you on as a school district is certainly the day-to-day -day sort of records that you keep. Homework assignments, maybe your grade book, um, papers uh, that you use in the classroom, bulletin boards you might put up. Certainly you can use the name uh, that the individual requests to be called, but when we're talking about official school records, um, best, pol best practices would dictate that your policy um, say that we're going to use whatever name um, is the student's legal name. So if the student hasn't gone through the process of using the courts to formally change their name, um, your official records probably should reflect um, that student's legal name. And that's not because we don't want to assist a student who is transitioning or be supportive of that student, but that's merely because those records are gonna follow that student um, through his or her life. Uh, school sports, physical education classes, I mentioned the WIAA um, policy. Um, that's really how you're going to respond to uh, student needs with respect to sports is following the WIAA policy if your events are WIAA sanctioned. 
Um, with respect to phys physical education class, those are questions that, again, you might want to um, address in your policies that you develop. Um, I put up here sort of the practical um, advice and considerations, and the one I want to bring your attention to is the, the bottom point, special education considerations. And this is one area that I don't think we necessarily think about when we're talking about um, transgender students because just because you're a transgender student doesn't automatically mean that you're a student with a disability who qualifies for a Section 504 plan or an IEP. Um, but because a student is transitioning and what it might do to the student psychologically, um, there might be some anxiety issues, I think you really have to be careful um, that if you have a student who is transitioning, that might be a student who could and should be um, identified as perhaps a special education student where we might need to um, undergo an evaluation for that student to determine if there are services the student needs. Um, if it is a special education student that you do have that is transitioning, there might be some supports then that you could include in the IEP that would assist the student in the transition process at school. So keep that in mind um, as you're um, dealing with students who are transitioning. It's not necessarily a point that you need to write into your policies, because of course that's going to be very specific student to student, but just simply remember your obligations um, under state and federal law with respect uh, to your special education population. Um, I'd like to sort of close my presentation with my sort of best advice to you as to what to do. And, and you probably notice that my best advice is all pretty vague and it all has question marks by it. Um, <laughs> and that's really because the state of the law is kind of gray, it's kind of unclear. We have guidance that tells us what might be best practices, but we also have courts that have held the opposite of what the best guidance has said. We have this little thing coming up in November, this election, where we might have a new party in power and some of these um, mandates that have come down from the Department of Education and the Department of Justice and the EEOC could go away, um, depending on who is elected to office. Um, so in terms of what we do, again, we're still kind of in a state of flux because things could change. And if you notice from my timeline that I kind of had at the beginning, April, May, there were seven different things that happened at the national level in just two short months. So in terms of developing or revising policies, what do we do? Um, I think one or the other might be in order. And again, that's something I know Verona has a, tra um, a transgender policy committee that is in place. That's something that um, your committee might want to talk about. Do we revise our current non-discrimination policy? One caution that I sort of throw out to you in taking that approach is that if you do revise your policy and say that transgender students are protected under your policy, you need to be sure you follow your policy um, because that's granting additional rights um, that aren't required by federal or state law yet. Um, so if you do amend and revise your current non-discrimination policy um, and then you don't follow it, not only might you be hit with a um, lawsuit on the federal side under Title IX, but you might also have a claim against you for not following your own policy. Um, do what's best for the student. Um, I don't necessarily think that this requires a, a question mark at the end, but doing what's best for the student is always, always going to help you to avoid finding yourself in court. Um, so there's you know, a lot of different things that, that you can do in thinking about how we're going to respond to these issues. Um, my last sort of foolproof, um, no way your district will ever get sued solution um, is really to take a look at your facilities, retrofit them, uh, build new facilities that have separate stalls, um, ceiling to floor doors um, where you can't see through any cracks, remove all your urinals, and really develop new restroom facilities for uh, your students to use. Um, now, probably all of you sitting out here are seeing dollar signs, dollar signs, dollar signs. Um, that's next to impossible to do. Um, but really, we're kind of at a point where that is the best solution. And so until we can get to the point where we can knock down all of our current facilities and rebuild new state-of-the-art facilities that provide the utmost privacy to every individual, we really have to work with what we have um, and use our best judgment as a district.
Um, so with that, I will sort of close my portion of the presentation and open it up to any questions that you might have. Sure. What accommodations would be made for a non-transgender student if they're very uncomfortable with the transgender? Let's say in the, re not in the restroom so much as the showers. Mm -hmm. So the question um, for those of you who may not have heard is, what do you do with the, the non-transgender student who might simply be uncomfortable with the transgender student who is coming in um, and using the facilities? Um, and one of the things that I, I sort of laugh and jest when I say this, but it's almost too bad because um, one of the things that is not protected under the law is um, the, the fears or misconceptions or um, the misplaced uh, um, the, the, the sort of misplaced fear that other individuals may have. So what you can offer a non-transgender student who has issues with a transgender student using the uh, facilities is for that non-transgender student to use a separate facility. Um, you can you know, provide shower curtains that will allow that non-transgender student to be separate and apart from the transgender student. Um, who is using the facilities. You can provide a separate changing area for that non-transgender student. And I say for the non-transgender student, it's not specific for that individual, but it's merely offering other options that any student can use rather than a mandate that only the transgender student should be required to use other facilities. I don't know who had, who had their hand up first, so even the yellow. Um, it's a comment rather than a question is that a lot of your presentation has been on male to female or female to male, but I think we all need to recognize that gender should be seen as a spectrum, and there may be students that don't identify as male or female, but something in between, and so if policies are made that are very specific in either direction for only male, only female, whether it's sex assigned at birth or gender identity, you're still going to have a whole group of people who are have no home. And, and I think that's a really good point. And I know you weren't asking a question, but just sort of to expand upon that, I think that's where your transition processes that you develop as a school are really important. Again, keeping in mind if you are developing a policy that there might be a group of students that you need to be concerned with, but those internal processes that you develop um, can really help to sort of smooth over some of the concerns that, that might be out there as well. <laughs> um, medical emergencies. You are working with a student who you know is going through the uh, transition, and it turns out that they are not under a doctor's guidance and there's a medical <coughs> emergency. Are you required to tell the parents what has happened? Um, I guess, what do you mean by that? that? That there's a medical emergency or that the student is, has indicated to you that the student's transitioning? Um, I'm talking about an actual medical emergency requiring hospitalization due to um, improperly taken hormonal treatments. Good question. <laughs> okay, and you, the teacher, know, but the parents don't know, and you are unaware that the parents didn't know. What do you do then? Well, and I think that that's a tricky situation, and that's something that I think you, as a school district, need to develop. Um, again, whether it's in your policies or sort of those transition plans that you have, how you're going to deal with things. Because you're absolutely right. One of the biggest questions that I get asked is, what do I do as a school district if a student comes to me and says they're transitioning, but they say, don't tell mom and dad because they're going to force me to go to church to be absolved of my sins, and they don't agree with what I'm doing. What, you know, what do you do as a district in that situation? And you know, what I tell school districts is, and, and I don't know if this is necessarily the right answer, but Title IX protects students, and so since the law is really going by the way of Title IX being extended to protect transgender students. Your student is going to be the one that has a cause of action in the federal courts against the school district. I don't know what the parent's cause of action is um, against a school district that doesn't abide by the parent's wishes to refer to their student as 
as Chrissy instead of Christopher. Um, I don't know that the parent has a cause of action. And so what you're going to find, perhaps, is the district in a legal battle um, over the student and what the student's rights are versus what the parent's rights are. So, you know, applying that to your situation within a medical emergency, it might not be, um, it might not be prudent for the teacher to disclose to the parent that there's, that the student was transitioning and that this, this is a result of, you know, hormones improperly taken. I mean, I would argue that a teacher probably shouldn't be giving a medical diagnosis anyway. I don't know how the teacher is going to be aware that, you know, this medical emergency is indeed caused by improper use of hormones and supplements and those types of things. And so it's probably not something that a teacher needs to relay to the parent. It can be there's a medical emergency and then that's left between the medical provider and the parent and the student. I don't want to say that that's a, you know, a way that the district dodges the bullet here and avoids um, the liability concern, but I'd, I'd be hard pressed to ever tell, um, tell a, an employee to, to tell a medical provider what they think the medical diagnosis should be. Question? Um, more of the, a comment adding on to uh, hers. Um, I have the, found that gender is much more than a, a line, and there are, there are people who don't even identify as male, female, or anywhere in between, or, or not. Um, it's just a little comment that I want to add. I appreciate your comment, and I think, and I think it's very well taken because you're right. A lot of my presentation does focus on the black and white, the, the male, the female, female, the male, but you certainly can't forget about that probably larger population of students who are in the middle. Um, so I think that's a great comment for um, the, the, the uh, Transgender Policy Committee to think about and maybe for the board to think about as well as, as you know, we start to develop these policies. With regard to that, <clears throat> see if I can. So the, the credible basis that was in your presentation, um, so for, for a district in terms of uh, adopting a policy, if you've got, if you've got a youngster who is, uh, who is um, neither identified as male or female, mm -hmm. and can, can alternately use either restroom, wh wherein lies a credible basis for, for that? Sure, and, and I think that's a situation where it's really hard to, um, tie down exactly what policy language should be used um, and what what you accept as credible um, evidence or credible documentation as to what the student is or isn't or where they where they lie on that spectrum. Um, I do think it's probably important for the district to and, and, and I hate to say this but almost pigeonhole the student as one as, as what <coughs> facility you're going to use, one or the other, because if you allow the student maybe one day to use the men's facility, the second day to use the women's facility and alternate between the two back and forth, I think that, that could be a situation where you open up the district to liability, but then also perhaps open up the student to forms of harassment and bullying because the student is, is maybe having this conflict. Um, I think, you know, best case scenario in that situation is you're really going to sit down with the student and have a discussion with the student as to, um, you know, what, okay, yes, you do have these feelings where you might feel pulled in both directions, you fall in the middle of the spectrum. What is it that you want us to do as a school district and try and um, ascertain what the student's wishes are? In that situation, the student might say, I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling here, I really want to use a separate facility separate and apart from all students, and you might be able to have that student assigned to use a faculty restroom. Again, it's what's in the best interest of the child. You've had that discussion with the child, maybe the child's parents or guardians as well, and have come to come to a type of resolution for it. So well, you might be able to sort of have policy language that dictates that you're going to allow students to use you know, restrooms and locker rooms of the gender in which they identify, you might also have the caveat in there that the district will certainly um, have dis discussions with individuals
individual students and act in accordance with the best interests of those students. And yet, it seems like the guidance that we're, we're given or the direction that we're given is the unfettered access, and we really don't have the right to even, even enter into that conversation if the student doesn't want to. Right, right. And I, and I think you're right. The, the guidance is truly unfettered access, but I think it's a matter of the student has to come to you as a district. It's certainly not something you can force on the student, which is sort of contrary to everything else that we do as a school district where we're sort of able to impose our will on the students and you know we get to set the parameters and the rules for the student being educated in our district. This is kind of one where we're writing the coattails of what the students' wishes are. And I think that, that for now, in terms of what best practices are, because we're really in sort of this state of flux where the law could change next week, uh, next month, and a year from now, it's really, truly best to, sure, you can implement a policy and sort of have your guidance as to how you're going to respond to situations, but oftentimes sitting down with a student um, is going to be paramount to anything else. Um, I'll just tell a quick story. I had one school district, they're a rural school district, um, a small school district, but I gave a presentation and you know mentioned the unfettered access language, um, using the pronouns that the student wishes, student records and things like that. And one of my school district clients sent their principal and their principal came up to me and introduced himself at the end of the presentation and he said, Chrissy, I have to tell you, all of the guidance that you gave me today, I'm doing the complete opposite of everything that you said. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, well tell me about it, what are you doing? And you know, he basically said, well I talked to the student and worked with the student and the student told me that he wanted this, this, didn't really uh, you know, want to use the restrooms of the opposite gender. We worked out a plan for how we were going to accommodate that student. I said, well, how are things going? He said, great, um, the student is you know, adjusting very well. Other students are supportive of the student. I said, you know what, don't change what you're doing. Um, just because you haven't maybe enacted a policy and haven't you know, posted notice that you're providing unfettered access doesn't mean that you're not doing right by way of that student. Question in the back. I have a question about the implications for communicating with other staff members. Mm -hmm. So if a student comes to you and tells <coughs> us you, there are also confidentiality rates that come into play. So how does that fit with creating this plan, communicating it so that when the student does go into the restroom that they have identified that they feel most comfortable in, then other staff members aren't formulating complaints or the student isn't exposed to um, some kind of uncomfortable situation. Sure, a really great question uh, for those who maybe could not hear is um, how do you handle the sharing of information with other uh, staff members in the district if you do have a student who has come to you and said um, that they are a transgender student or are transitioning. Um, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that a student's um, sex is protected um, under FERPA and it's made part of a student's educational record and the only way that we can share educational records with other educators or staff members in the district is, is if there is a legitimate educational interest at stake. And so you have to make the determination as to whether you know, restroom use and potential discipline related to restroom use is a legitimate educational interest that requires other faculty, other staff members to know um, that that student is transitioning. In some situations, it might be important for um, a staff member to be aware um, of a student transitioning. In other situations, it might be sufficient for um, staff members to know that there certainly are uh, students in the district uh, who have been identified as students who are transitioning. We're not going to directly name those individuals, um, but if you do see something, you know, you can certainly bring it to the attention of the principal, um, you know, of your district administrator, of somebody else, um, but uh, as, a, as a practice, disseminating that information to um, staff as a whole would not be best practices because you're risking potential FERPA violations. So kind of two questions. One, I'm curious as to what the borough policy is right now, today. And then two, what are, what are the rights kind of the other student? You know, so if you do have non-transitioning students and you have a transgender student going back and forth between two different bathrooms, don't the other students have some right to know whether this is, you know, if this is somebody who's transitioning, if it's just a boy sneaking into the girl's bathroom, or, or what, what, are, what are their rights? I mean, yeah. So I'll answer.
answer the, the second part of your question, what other students' rights are, and then I'll have Dean address um, what the current state of the policy is here at the district. But <coughs> with respect to other students, um, simply because they might have an issue or a privacy right or safety concern, that's certainly something they can bring to the attention of teacher, principal, other staff member. Um, and then, you know, it can kind of go up the chain of command to determine whether or not the student should be using the restroom. But in terms of what that student's, you know, rights are, they do have, you know, the right to complain. They do have a right to ask the teacher um, or a principal if the student should be using the facility. But in terms of what your response is, it's really, okay, that's something I will, I will look into. You know, thank you for the information. But that's really all you can share. Um, unless, of course, the student has said that they want it to be made known, that the student is transitioning, that they are okay with you maybe making an example of the person and using that individual as sort of a means to demonstrate what the policies are of the district and how the district is responding to that individual. Um, I mean, that kind of raises a question of what do we do as a whole as a district when um, you're dealing with a student who's transitioning and maybe there's parent concerns, the general public wants to know, maybe there's you know, a volleyball game taking place and somebody sees a male going into the female restroom, how do we know that that's a student who's transitioning and not just simply a male who's using the female restroom? Um, and those are concerns, you know, again, I think you as a district can accept you know, sort of those complaints or inquiries, but in terms of information that you provide, I think that's really gonna be dependent, again, upon what the student has, and the parents of the student perhaps have authorized you to, to disseminate. I, I guess my question is, is that we don't really have policies, and it's kind of not, I mean, I think if you have a restroom that says whichever, mm -hmm. and everybody knows that mm -hmm. that's okay, and they're not looking over their shoulder, whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable, it's just, and especially with younger students, mm -hmm. just knowing what to expect. And, it, and and that's where it feels like leaving the rest of the students in the dark just sets it up for a bad scenario. Well, I think maybe what you're referring to then is, is sort of what is the status of the policy so that everybody knows what's happening. Yeah. And I think that's you know where the district is at in the process in terms of what are we going to have as our policy? What guidance are we going to give to our student body, to the public as to where we're at in that process, and Dean, maybe you want to elaborate on where the district is at. Sure, um, thank you. Earlier this uh, school year, and back in early fall, the board authorized the, um, the formation of an ad hoc committee to draft a policy for transgender students and staff. And so we met through the month of October, um, three or four times, and then we drafted some policy based on language from national and uh, regional sources. And then we, we put that in front of our policy reviewer at the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, and that took um, some time for that person to review that. Because this policy is brand new to the district, and it touches other policies, like the non-discrimination policy, the bullying uh, harassment policy, and a couple of others. And then uh, we had our own um, district council take a look at that. And so that's been reviewed at all those levels. And then just as recently as a couple of weeks ago, we had the committee come back together. And the committee was made up of uh, BASD staff, uh, students from the high school, uh, some parents and community members, and uh, myself and uh, Annie Allman, the board member, was on that committee. And so where it is right now, it's in draft form. It has uh, not been reviewed by the board. We anticipate the board will have its first hearing of it, uh, uh, perhaps as early as two weeks from tonight, uh, June 20th, could be delayed later than that, but one of the things we wanted for the board here, especially, is this presentation to help get some guidance and some um, some direction to that. So that's part of the timing of it. But the policy does uh, talk about, I think, all of your bullet points and touches in there about records, confidentiality, pronouns, um, a library room, restroom, dress code, voting harassment, uh, media, mm -hmm. things like that. So it covers I had two questions. Uh, the first has to do with what the, what you really advise districts for, like prom or homecoming court. <coughs> oftentimes the ballot is prepared based on the information in the student data system. And you might not know what student's preference is to be identified until after the voting and the counting and stuff. So do most schools kind of do away with courts or you know, with the homecoming king and queen or prom? I mean, is that kind of you suggesting? So the, the significant guidance that came out by the Department of Justice and Department of Education
treat, you know, the, if, if it's a female transitioning to male, you treat the individual as a male, allow that individual to be on the ballot as a male for, for a candidate for homecoming court or prom court. Um, you know, in terms of how you handle that as a district, as you're, as you're preparing the ballots, you can't be expected to do something that you know nothing about. So if you haven't had a student approach you and let you know that they're transitioning, you have no reason to know that they should be on, on the ballot in one category versus the other category. So you go based on what, what your student records tell you. Um, then I think with respect to those students who have indicated to you that, that they're transgender, that they are transitioning, um, then that, that's going to be in accordance with your policy, or if you don't have a policy, what practices you want to develop as a district as to where that individual might fall. But the guidance is to allow the student to participate as the gender that they identify with. And could I ask a second question? Mm -hmm. so my second question has to do with um, yearbook names. I know like a yearbook is not an official document, like a transcript or like reporting mm -hmm. mechanism, but it's student produced. So oftentimes students don't necessarily know the preference, especially if it's somewhat confidential. I, I know sometimes a student might have a preference in a classroom with the teacher, what pronoun and the bulletin board display, but when it's, you know, you're kind of working on a bigger document that student produced, what are your suggestions for that? So I, you know, I think the same principle applies. You can't expect students to know what, what they're not told. Um, and so they can go by the names that, that are in sort of the, the district's directory of students. But I think that, that brings up a good point because that is probably one of the topics that you want to discuss with the student in the transition plan are things that you just identified their prom court, um, yearbooks, um, uh, you know, how they wish to be addressed in all aspects of their educational experience at the district, including those ex extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities, clubs, and things of that nature. Um, and and this, you're right, a student might not have come out to the entire you know, student body that they're transitioning, and the student body might not be aware of it, but if you have that transition in place and the student has already indicated that he wishes to use the female name in the yearbook, um, then I think that's something that you can relay then to, to your student yearbook um, group that this is how the student is going to be addressed, and then that's the name that you provide um, sort of in that directory that you're going to be uh, giving that group. It's hard because the student may have been, although birth name was Robert, may have been Stephanie throughout the school career, starting in third grade. So nobody may have ever known this person as Robert until they cross the stage at graduation and somebody has the official legal name. And that's such a tragedy. And you know, I work in healthcare and we of course have all these records that are the legal things. And we mess up all the time calling people things that they don't want to be called. And we've tried in the electronic medical record now to have a preferred name field, mm -hmm. which is super helpful so that everybody can see it and it shows up on all the labels. But it's it's hard from the legal standpoint. In Wisconsin, you can't change your sex on your birth certificate. Some states, you can. <laughs> Am I wrong? I've been told that you couldn't, but okay, good, you can. But anyway, having all those things match our heart. And so preferred name is one way to get around it, but mm -hmm. um, this implication that she's talking about is everybody is transitioning. Just remember, if this gender is identified when you're really young, really nobody may know um, what their sex assigned at birth was.
different issues that school districts in DC have seen um, and offered, again, those forms and some guidance on, on how you might respond to things in your school district. So um, we um, are in compliance with the legal name being what's in Power School, and which is our student data system. Okay. This is a, a feed, or adding on to Rita's question about yearbook, et cetera. So I hear what you're saying is that if a student prefers like on the homecoming ballot, prom court, yearbook, that, that they would like us to use their preferred name. Um, we have had incidents where the parents don't agree with that name change for that student. So what would you recommend if the student would like us to use their preferred name, but their parent does not agree with that and the student is not 18? And they have not, and in this example, the student does not have a legal name change. Again, I think that's a really tough situation, and I, <laughs> I would, I mean, quite frankly, my advice is to go with what the student says. And I could be absolutely wrong on this. I, admittedly, it's not the law. The law is not clear. So I could be giving you advice where you're going to get called into court and you're going to um, you know, get sued and have to pay out on this issue. And in that case, we're not establishing an attorney-client relationship here. So. <laughs> I can't say it's wrong. Gotcha. <laughs> So you can't come back at me for malpractice, but I do think, as I, as I mentioned before, I think it is the student that is going to have the cause of action under Title IX. And just, again, simply the trajectory that we've gone and where we're at with the law, I think if that student has a complaint and goes to federal court and says that, you know, I have requested to be called Matthew and they won't, and the school district is not abiding by my wishes, um, I, I think that the district faces real liability based on a student claim, where again, I'm not sure what type of legal claim the parent has, other than I'm the parent and should be able to parent as I want. So maybe there's some type of common law negligence claim um, or interference or you know, tort type of claim, but there, but there has to be some harm, and what's the harm to, to the parent? That um, at school my child is being called something I don't agree with, um, I can tell you my parents didn't necessarily like me being called Chrissy by everybody, but um, you know, that's, that's what I chose and, and, schools, and schools allowed me to be called Chrissy. And so I, you know, I think kind of the same principles apply. Again, I could be wrong on that, but I do think you, that, that the safest route for you is to go based on, on what the student requests. Now I think you know, the next question is going to be, well, what if it's a first grader who comes to me and says that they want to be called Mia instead of Matthew? How, how do we deal with that? Because I think it's a very different situation maybe than a 16-year-old. Um, how, how do you respond to that situation? And I think it's really tricky. Again, I think, um, you know, the student is the one with the cause of action. Sure, the student can't bring the cause of action on his or her own unless the student's been emancipated or... Um, the parent brings the claim, but I think that you face a, a greater potential for exposure um, by simply sort of stifling what the student's w wishes are in favor of, of the parent's demands. I think this is a good final spot. question. Yeah, I was going to say, we're, do we have one more quick question? Yeah. Um, actually, two part. Actually, <laughs> comment on that. Um, you just go with like how we did in the military and use our last names. All the time. <laughs> 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 student, student Jones. <laughs> but I was just wanted to ask you if you could summarize the court's findings on the Nicole Maines case and how what how was the school at fault? What what did they find? So in that case, uh, this was again the first grade student had had come to the school had said, I, I'm a male, but I feel female. The parents in this situation were supportive of the student and have been supportive all along. Um, and if you ask the parents, they will say, at least the mother will tell you that she knew from a very young age, even younger than the first grade year, that the student was, was identifying as a female. Um, and so very strong parent support there. And she wanted to use the female restroom. And in that case, what had happened was the school district complied and allowed her to use the female restroom and let her do so. And then, of course, there was a complaint uh, by somebody else. And at that point, at the point in time when the complaint came in, the school district said, eh, you know what, there was a complaint. 
you're going to have to go back to using the boys' restroom. Um, the family had moved several times to try and sort of avoid some of these issues um, that have come up with the student transitioning and going back and forth between uh, the two restrooms. And ultimately, the court said that it was a violation of their state non-discrimination law for them to require her to use um, the, the, the male restroom uh, because she did identify as a female and gender identity was something that was protected under their state law. Now, Maine state law is written differently than Wisconsin's is. It's more broad in terms of its protections. So would we get the same result in, here in Wisconsin? Probably not, just simply based on how the law is written. Um, but it could go that way. Um, and it could be a more broad interpretation of the law that the court reads. Didn't, didn't the school uh, allow her to use the staff restroom? Was that the same case? Um, I, I want to say that they perhaps did, um, but don't quote me on that. That might be another case. There have been a lot of them where some go the way of saying, no, you have to use your restroom. Some go the way of, we'll provide you with this, this faculty alternative. So if you would make a staff or a <coughs>